now. It looks like, uh, it, yeah. It is I just did it. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and then I really welcome uh, Q&As throughout today's discussion. If you do have some, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And then just know that as we approach the end of the hour, we will definitely leave some time for some questions that you might have for Carson. Uh, and then just regarding format today, uh, I'm going to be asking Carson a set of questions and also when it feels appropriate, just adding in some pertinent information uh, around the particular issue of perinatal mental health and offering that perinatal mental health perspective. So without further ado, it is such an honor and great pleasure to introduce to you Carson Meyer. Carson is a donor certified birth doula and birth photographer from Malibu, California. She attended New York University's Gallatin School of Individualized Studies, where she pursued studies in child development, art therapy, and alternative medicine. In 2016, Carson returned to Los Angeles and began her journey as a doula with training from Beanie Birth founder and DONA president, Anna Paula Markle. Again, it is such a pleasure to have you, Carson. And I'm just gonna jump right in uh, and ask you if, if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself and most importantly, what brought you into the field of, of birth support? Thank you, Paige. Um, first of all, I just wanna say like, how grateful I am for the work that you do, not only for mothers, but um, you provide such a valuable resource to doulas as well. I, as we chatted about before, I find that that was something that was really missing in my education around becoming a doula was um, how to address PMADs and um, this very common issue that so many of my clients experience. And so just knowing that I can send them your way or reach out to you has been a tremendous gift to me as well. Um, but yeah, so I, I got into this work. Um, I, I went to Gallatin. I was really interested. I didn't know what a doula was, but I look back and kind of joke that I ended up building a curriculum around being a doula. I was really fascinated um, with the way that we could use some creativity and Eastern practices and um, use alternative medicine for this mind-body connection. So I was fascinated by, by that in the world of mental health, but I also had a strong passion around uh, women's health and children. And so I was assigned at one point at school to watch the business of being born, which I hope everybody here has seen. Um, if not, I highly recommend it. Um, and that really struck me. It was the first time I always say I kind of was like, it was split 50, 50. Part of me was like, oh my gosh, this is the most beautiful, amazing thing I've ever seen. I'd never ever seen live footage of birth. That wasn't like a Hollywood scripted, terrifying image of birth. Like, And so in this documentary, you really get to see the different ways that people give birth in their power. And I was so touched and blown away by that. And then the other half of me, I cried because I was really upset to learn about the way that um, women were treated in the birth space and how our medical system had failed so many women. Um, by turning birth into a business or just um, treating the birth space like the business that it is in many hospitals. And so as a young woman, I also was really surprised, you know, I'd gone to sex ed in high school and I knew to be really afraid of getting pregnant and giving birth because that was what was drilled into, you know, us as teens. And then I was like, nobody comes back and helps you unlearn that fear, right? There's no class later on that tells you once you are ready to become a parent or are becoming a parent that you can actually, um, you have choices, you have options, right? This does not have to be a terrifying experience that you have um, no say in, like those images that I think we're all shown um, in films, right? That like just terror and chaos. And so, as a, as a young woman, I think I was really fascinated by that and felt kind of wronged. I was like, what, where are, where's that community that's going to show me that? And so I was, uh, that was what sparked my interest in this work. Um, I went, moved back home and met a midwife like the first week I was back home and it felt kind of like a sign. And 
I ended up doing the training she had done to become a doula beforehand and never looked back. That's such an amazing and, and inspiring story, Carson. And, and you hit the nail on the head of something that we speak of so frequently uh, to women that are struggling, um, either that are seeking treatment and getting treatment at the motherhood center or just, you know, in women that we come in contact with, whereas, you know, there's so much about birth and motherhood that lacks true honesty and preparation, right? And so what we spend a lot of time talking about and educating, you know, women that are trying to conceive and beyond is that a lot of motherhood is, is very strongly romanticized. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of myths that we are spoon fed uh, about motherhood and what it's to be like and feel like. And so when we find ourselves pregnant or postpartum, overwhelmed, insecure, feeling as though we're doing everything wrong, feeling disappointed because we didn't have the birth that we anticipated or we absolutely long for and miss the identity that we had once we, before we became a mother, we are so underprepared and unprepared for what it really means to transition to motherhood. Um, and, you know, I, I was just talking to a group that I run in the day program this week about you know, I'm not old enough to have benefited from home ec, but like, I think back on those days when like, that was actually a class and like people were learning how to be mothers. And I'm not, you know, it's a very obviously obsolete form of education, but like, how nice would it be if like we had some kind of contemporary experience where women and men were taught about what it is to become a parent right and all the things that you can anticipate and know and feel better prepared to tackle so that when they happen to you you're not completely disoriented and surprised feeling like you're the only one who's having a hard time getting through this period or doing this thing so yeah. i appreciate your honesty i think that's that's so true having that just the education of it can make all the difference. And I always tell my, my clients, I'm like, I, I don't want the nine months or being pregnant to feel like the SAT, right? Like you're cramming to learn. Right. Um, and so I, I do really believe I don't have kids myself. And I don't, I think it's never too early to start um, exploring your options and learning about just how to optimize your health for this, this process in mind and body. Yeah, absolutely. Carson, what is it about the work that you love? Uh, and on the flip side of that, what are some of the challenging aspects of the work? Yeah, so, you know, I, I say it's the best job in the world. I feel so lucky that um, this is what I get to do. I get to be alongside people um, on their most memorable day of their lives, most likely, um, while they get to meet their baby and fall deeply in love and reach a level of love that I think a lot of people didn't even know existed within them. And so um, to me, that's just such beautiful work. I love just getting to jump in and like getting to know new people and be alongside them on this journey. I love teaching. I love babies, of course, but I really just love, I love women. I, I like really love mothers. I, I love getting to support them. So I think it's, um, I pinch myself and I'm like, this is what I get to do. But I, I I'm, I love how you also uh, phrase that question because I do think that there is a romanticism around birth work, um, that it is just babies and cuddles and just pure like joy all the time. And that is a big part of it, but it's also really um, some of this work does break your heart and um, the culture that we live in for so many reasons. Um, is can be very disappointing and and very upsetting and i think you know we're starting to realize that fortunately through the black lives matter movement we're really starting to have a better understanding on just the mainstream of people who are beyond i think for for all of us in birth work it hasn't been new information um but how racism plays a role in um birth right and in, in the united states and how um a lot of women based but on the color of their skin or on their, you know, where they live, what state they reside in, you know, what their healthcare affords um, does not 
they do not always get the care that they deserve. And I think that is a really difficult part of this process is um, being a, inside a system that is um, broken, I think is fair to say. Um, and so I'm, I think, you know, what you've created is one of those solutions um, and such a wonderful solution. But I do, I wish that more, more parents had the resources and support that they deserve. And I think it, it's, it's certainly hard. And I think a lot of doulas would probably agree um, to see evidence not always line up with policy in the hospital. And being a doula, we're not medical professionals. We're never there to, you know, get, interfere with the uh, provider's recommendations. Um, but I, I think a lot, of, a lot of this work also has to navigate liability, right? And some of the, and um, burnout right. <laughs> in the hospital setting and um, policy and all of that. And so it is, it's, it's all of that joy, but I think as an advocate too, you also, you realize that you're, we're in this job for a reason and that is to advocate for our clients. And sometimes you leave feeling so rewarded by that work. And sometimes it feels defeated. You feel defeated and you do witness trauma. Um, you do witness disrespect and obstetrical violence. And um, it's that, that part I think is, is very complicated. So if that kind of answers your question, it is the best work in the world, but I, I sometimes find that I might be too sensitive for it. You yeah. perfectly answered it. And, you know, to your point, it is atrocious that women of color tend to experience um, a lower level of care than they deserve uh, in the birth experience. And when we hear stories like somebody as well known as, as Serena Williams and, and what she experienced in giving birth and thankfully to the groups out there like Every Mother Counts um, and other really powerful, important groups that are raising awareness around the experience for women of color um, and uh, you know the disparities in birth yeah. outcomes and birth experience. Uh, it absolutely should not be this way. Um, and I am glad to see that that acknowledgement is is getting louder and that that we're starting to cover this and recognize what an what an undeniable issue it is. And I am hopeful um, that that it will continue to stay at the forefront. And as a result, we will start to see an improvement in maternal health outcomes and birth outcomes um, and, and everything that deserves to happen and absolutely should be happening. Uh -huh. And to your point about, you know, what it, what it is like to be a doula in those most amazing ethereal moments of watching birth happen and being a part of that magic of like mom and baby meeting for the, for the very first time, there's also clearly a lot of challenges to being in that room. Uh, and for a while, we were offering support groups to doulas to be able to process their own exposure to trauma. It could be secondary, it could be primary, right? Like bearing witness to something that a mother might have had to endure in her birth process or even the treatment that doulas receive. And this is not across the board. I'm sure you can speak to some amazing OBGYNs and midwives that Absolutely. rolled out their red cards. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's other times when doulas are perhaps not taken as seriously as they should be. And they're not, they're not, you know, embraced as an advocate for the mother and the couple, um, which is exactly, you know, why doulas are, are so critical and important. And, and I've heard from so many first time moms, especially those with PMAD, since that's who we treat. If only I had known what I needed during my birth process, I feel like it could have gone so differently because I never gave birth before. I just did whatever I was told to do. I didn't know there were other positions. I didn't know that I didn't have to take an epidural. I didn't know this, that, or the other thing, you know, and this, and, and this will get to really the crux of, of why we're speaking today in a bit of why it's, it can be so helpful to have a doula, but to have somebody there speaking on your behalf, who knows this inside and out is such an, an extra level of strength um, and support that, you know, I, I wish that every birthing mother could have, but we're gonna, we're gonna dive into that in just a moment. But, but before we do, you know, you're on the front lines, you've been delivering prior to the pandemic, during the pandemic, how has the role of a doula changed 
uh, since COVID-19 hit seven months ago. Yeah, so one, when, I think was it February now? February, seven months ago, um, we, and, and I can't speak for every state, actually every hospital is different. There's one hospital, a little company in, um, here in Los Angeles that remained open to doulas, but pretty much every other hospital um, did not allow doulas here in California. And then it was, or in Los Angeles, I know New York was not even allowing partners. Um, and some other hospitals did that as well. Here in Los Angeles, we had that um, in postpartum. So it's kind of all over the place and still is. Fortunately, um, here, at least for the hosp most of the hospitals that I work at um, or my, that I, my clients go to, I, we are, we're finally allowed back in, which is very exciting. Um, but I, I wish, I think we all had like a, a through line to it because it, like I said, it varies hospital to hospital, state to state, city to city. Um, and then even just situation to situation, I'm still hearing stories of do, some of those not being allowed in because they're not certified or just for a number of different reasons. Um, and that, that becomes a whole complicated issue as well. Certification can be um, a very useful way to know that somebody is in fact a doula, um, but it's also a way of excluding people who might have um, been trained in this work through more like ancestral wisdom or through mentorship, or maybe did not have the finances to go through the certification process. So it's it's also complicated. But I, um, I've been working virtually in that time in between, uh, which is interesting. <laughs> it still allows me uh, to be that advocate in the room and to be you know, working with my clients through breath, breath work, meditations, um, giving the partner suggestions, but it's not, it's not the same. I'm not, I, I didn't realize until now how nonverbal my work is, right? I, I really realize now that when I'm in the birth space, so little talking happens. Um, and all of a sudden when you're here, there's, you're kind of having to project more and really use your words to support instead of your touch and your, um, just that, energetic connection with your client. So it's been better than nothing, but I'm definitely looking forward to being back in. Um, and I started a, a virtual circle for moms, expecting moms through this time. And that was a gift for me that had come out of, and hopefully for them as well, um, that has come out of this time. Um, I found that so many people were really eager to have information, knowing that they might have to be giving birth without a doula or their partner or the support that they thought they would have. And so I think that was um, one of the bright silver linings of <laughs> a, a dark time um, was, was really seeing a spike in curiosity. And so I started that circle to uh, create a space for moms to really do like weekly um, to connect with one another and then work weekly on preparing. Oh, it's so important to, um, there was an article the Times has been doing for those of you who haven't caught it. They have a parenting section that's been doing such honest justice to what it's like to transition to motherhood right now in this pandemic. And an article that they released this week is how, uh, you know, there is, there is the, like, this is the most unprecedented unprecedented time that has ever existed in American culture going all the way back to the beginning where women are this isolated um, yeah. in their parenting and especially, you know, in their pregnancy and postpartum period. Mm -hmm. And how, when we look back historically, you know, that proverbial village, uh, it takes a village, it, it really always has. And it hasn't been until recently where, you know, we've seen this new trend of like real isolation, even prior to the pandemic. So couples raising a child, right? Like, especially in New York City, which is where we are, we see so many transplants from other places. So mom, you know, mom's family members might be on one side of the globe and partner's family members might be on the other, which means that mom and partner are the ones that are raising this baby solo and working full time, perhaps even after a short maternity leave. So anything that we can be doing right now to create these villages and these connections for women to establish relationships, albeit not in person, but even at least virtually, so they can go through this together. They can ask questions, they can support one another, they can stay in touch after the baby comes and 
be that village for each other is so important. And so I just applaud your efforts in, in creating that and making that possible. I'm sure the women that participate find it incredibly helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been interesting. And I, I'm curious as what you have been recommending to patients that you're seeing. And obviously, I'm not a doctor. This is not a recommendation. Please, I'll take this with a grain of salt as but I have been saying like, you know, the, the risks of isolation, especially if you have um, certain um, pre-existing mental health kind of conditions that would uh, make you at a higher risk for PMADS um, or you find that you are experiencing that and suffering, um, it might be wise to find a pod in person, right? To really just weigh out your risks and benefits and find trusted people to connect with in person. And so again, I'm that's not right for everyone, but I have seen people follow the distancing guidelines so strongly to their own detriment um, in this time that has never been intended to be done alone. I think that is excellent advice. And you know, aside from the statistics that I shared in the beginning of this, you know, I, I've been saying very often that, you know, we know that there, as clinicians, there are risk factors that uh, put women at a greater risk to develop a PMAD. And so three out of four of those primary risk factors are what every person is experiencing today, every day. It's uh, isolation, lack of social support, and managing high levels of stress and anxiety. That is the new normal. Um, and and it, it, it's, it's feeling a bit unrelentless these days. And so it makes a lot of sense that women are struggling more now than other, or more now than ever. So to be able to facilitate and make available those types of, of groups um, that, that women can join for support. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we offer many different types of support groups through the Motherhood Center. Another really great resource is Postpartum Support International. They are kind of the mothership of everything PMAD related. They've been around since the early 80s. And they have just a plethora of different support groups. Again, all virtual in every city and state and even internationally uh, for women that are looking for a village. Um, so, you know, if anybody happens to be uh, pregnant or postpartum or just a parent that's feeling really isolated right now, there are groups out there. There are places that you can find a sense of community, which we're all so desperate for right now. So that can absolutely be a real source of, of support and help. Uh, Carson, what are the benefits and drawbacks of having a virtual doula versus an in-person doula? And in that question, why just overall, you know, what are the benefits of having a doula in the birthing process? So the benefits of having a doula, which I think is very exciting that we have research, right? Everybody loves studies to hold on to. Um, the benefits are evidence-based. So we know that having a continuous support person through labor uh, results in better outcomes for mom and baby. Um, that it can be in terms of um, reducing the risk of postpartum depression or se severity of postpartum depression, um, promotes a more likelihood of a vaginal birth, um, reduces likelihood of uh, vacuum use in labor, also reduces or, or increases overall APGAR score for baby. So there's pretty much across the board, tremendous benefits for mom and baby. And I would argue as well, partner. Um, and as I, I mentioned before, having a virtual doula, yes, you might not get the full package in terms of the yummy massage and, and having that person really there to hold the space. But um, I always say most of the work that I do is, is the prep work and, and prenatal work before the birth. Um, I think if you go in there, even if you just worked with a doula virtually and not necessarily having a doula present at your birth, you still have a tremendous opportunity to learn about your options, um, to learn about the benefits and risks of certain interventions to build that toolkit. And then, you know, having a doula, we, we don't have research yet, I don't think on virtual doulas, um, but I do think that having um, a doula able to hold space, even if it's virtually, allows you to, in the, in the moment, have, gives the partner the opportunity to ask questions, um, helps to, as I mentioned before, too, you still get that advocate, someone to um, 
be there in the capacity to um, never speak on behalf of, I never speak on behalf of my clients, but to help them, I say, hold the mirror to themselves, right? And realize what they need. Um, and then to go through with their provider all the, the questions that need to be asked before making these decisions and um, really helping them to, to be sure that they are getting that attention from the hospital, which is obviously in many, many hospitals are overwhelmed and limiting contact with their patients. Um, and I do think that having a doula can help to kind of remind both parties to be in, in conversation. Mm -hmm. So well said. I am a active user of a doula for both of my births, and I don't. I can't imagine what it would have been like without. Um, again, just just somebody giving me permission to try things differently, right? That you know, due to the nature, especially of of delivery work from a medical provider. I mean, OBGYNs are delivering you know, hundreds of babies a day. And oftentimes when there's a lot going on on the L and D floor, they're running back and forth in between, right? Checking, seeing how dilated you are, running out, delivering another baby, checking back in. So to have that consistent person by my side who was telling me, you know, checking in, how are you feeling? You know, and it, and it was it's so interesting, the birth process, and you could probably write a book about this, but I feel like if ever there was a time where a woman is most in touch with her body, it's during birth, right? And so I just remember saying, yeah, this position is not working for me anymore. I need to do something else now. And her being like, okay, let's try this. But yeah. that person next to you, you know, you're kind of stuck with this doesn't feel good anymore. And I don't know what to do. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's, go ahead. I, my clients, when you're in labor, your brain slows down to 50% of its normal speed. Um, which we need. It's the body's so brilliant, right? Birth is not logical. It is. It does not need any of that thinking. Um, and so, you, I want my client to drop into that space where they're not thinking. And so, like you said, having somebody there, it's as silly as it sounds to literally be like, "This is the position that might feel better." It's like, "Oh, okay, right." Or even, "Let's try sitting on the toilet. Right. Let's have some water." Like all of those things, a laboring person they sound so simple and we, we don't even think and do them all day long, but really having somebody to help remind you of, of little things that can bring you comfort goes such a long way. So true. So, you know, moms and their partners are doing the best that they can to plan ahead for delivery. And as we touched on, there's just so much uncertainty and a lot of ambivalence. Um, and, and, you know, we, we're not, all, we're never really quite sure what to anticipate, but what can you share um, that, you know, to moms and their partners by way of the best kind of planning they can do for birth in the time of the pandemic? Yeah, I, I think preparation, 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 um, really choosing your provider wisely. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. I am a big fan of the birth plan. I hate the word plan because we know we cannot plan birth, but I see a lot of people saying, oh, I, I'm not going to have a birth plan. I'm not going to um, do that because I don't want to control my birth. And I think the the intention behind that is so beautiful, right? It is, and, and, and so valuable, right? Anybody who's not trying to micromanage the birth is going to benefit from that mindset. Um, but that said, I call it a birth intentions mm -hmm. um, so that we can drop this idea of planning, but still honor the fact that you will have so many decisions that you can make that can lead to better birth outcomes and a better experience, right? Even just starting with having a doula. Part of that research is knowing that when you have labor support, you tend to have even just a better, um, when you recall your birth, your experience of it tends to be more positive, um, which helps then to, you know, reduce likelihood of, of having um, certain trauma in the birth that would result in postpartum mood disorders. Um, but I, I'm a big fan of, of creating that birth intentions, um, working with a doula, or you, know, you can even find just templates online, or I love evidencebasedbirth.com, incredible resources, um, really great uh, studies that are 
like just typed out and explained in layman's terms. I know for me, like when I go to look at a study, I'm like, oh my gosh, where do I start? Whereas like she breaks it down and makes studies accessible. Um, it's, it's a fantastic resource and a really helpful way to, to discuss what you, what's important to you with your provider. And I find so many parents are like, my doctor knows best, whatever they say goes. Um, but as I mentioned before, unfortunately in the United States, the evidence of what is best for mom and baby is not what always lines up with policy and protocol. Mm -hmm. And so I really invite my clients and anybody here who's, um, planning and giving birth, uh, to know your, know, know your options, right? Know, know the research around some of your choices and do not be afraid to ask for what you need and what you want. Mm -hmm. You are the authority over your body. Nobody can make decisions for you. Um, but I do think it makes it a lot easier to make those decisions for yourself and for your baby when you know, um, when you know, right? When you know you can and when you know what might be best for you as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, and for some people that means seeking outside of, you know, home birth or midwifery care, which can also be very valuable to some. So education and communication with your provider. And don't be afraid to switch providers. If you find that the provider might not be in line with what's important to you, that's okay. You'll find the right provider that works for you. That is so important, just that goodness of fit, right? And I think, you know, I certainly fall into this category. Sometimes we can second guess our instinct and just kind of push through it, even if it doesn't feel quite right. You know, like, oh, but I've heard great things about this OBGYN or this midwife or this, you know, birth person that I'm working with. I should just keep going, you know, but, but listen to that instinct. And it is so important to have a goodness of fit in the birth experience. It's so funny in my midwife practice, um, there were, it was, it was four women and three of them I loved, but there was one of them that I I just didn't feel like we clicked very much. And so I always kind of secretly hoped that she would not be the person delivering my baby. We have since talked about this many times. So if by some weird <laughs> thing to this, she's heard the story before. Um, and so I went into my water broke in the middle of the night with both my children, which was just so great because I didn't sleep for like 48 hour stretch. But uh, I called and my favorite midwife was on call. I was so excited that I was going to have this one. And she was like, yeah, I don't think you need to come into the hospital yet. And my shift is ending, you know, in six hours. And so this other person is going to be coming on then. I was like, oh no, I've got to have this baby in the next six hours. Anyway, the moral of the story is I did end up getting this midwife that uh, I thought was going to be the, the, the not best fit. She was the best person for me uh. in my birth. I could have ever happened. Now I know this goes against the grain of what we were just saying. Um, and it, you know, you should trust your instinct, but I just thought that it was funny that this was the one person that I thought would not be a good fit and ended up being exactly what I needed. Um, and so, I think yeah. that's pretty good birth. Some of the times I think the things that birth takes you on a journey of what you do really need, sometimes, yeah. which might be so different than what you thought you wanted yeah. or needed. Um, so I think both can be true. Yeah. But and I want to just touch on um, just the, the the reality of birth trauma and what we always say about birth trauma is that it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, you know what what might feel traumatic to one woman might not to another, uh, and vice versa. And so again, just to speak to the power and the importance of having a doula there, you know, in your empirical evidence that you stated is that it, it can absolutely minimize. A traumatic birth experience. And as you pointed out, there is direct correlation between traumatic birth and the onset of a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. A traumatic birth can really open the floodgates um, to anxiety, um, to feeling a sense of failure as though my body didn't perform correctly. This isn't what was supposed to happen. I did something wrong. It's my fault that this happened. And so having, again, that advocate there to kind of walk you through all of the different options um, and let you know that there isn't just one way to do it can really minimize, you know, the experience of a traumatic birth and therefore significantly reduce the possibility of, of feeling depressed or anxious after the birth. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to add to how important I think informed consent, um, what the role that plays in birth trauma and 
um, a mother's recollection of the birth because birth is your, I mean, I really believe it's the most powerful, strongest um, experience one can go through. And when somebody is being, when somebody's being told that they cannot through that um, or their words are not being heard, I find a lot of parents tend to look back on their birth experience as something that lacked power and lacked strength. Mm -hmm. And that can be um, traumatic for them that they did not have um, a, a, a voice and they were not, they were being in, in silence. So something to pay attention to, I would say is when you do talk to your providers is um, how, wh what is the, com is it, is it you can and can't, or is it, here are, here is the evidence, here are the choices, you have the power to choose. And that is, I think, the way that I, I wish and hope um, the birth environment will, can be for all women. And I hope that our system changes to become um, more in line with, with what we know about the, I mean, informed consent is, is law, right? It is how it's supposed to be, but unfortunately I, we don't see it that much. And so to just pay attention to that, right? Um, you can make those decisions for yourself. You, your voice can, ma does matter. Um, and your provider is there to answer your questions. So true. And as you were speaking, I just, you know, one of the things that we try to make space for frequently in the day program and just for our patients that are postpartum in particular is the ability to share the birth experience. It is such a badge of courage and honor and strength for so many women. I'm actually, my arm hairs are standing up and it's been 14 years since it happened, but like to be able to give birth, right. And to have that experience, you know, just the fact that we can do that, you know, if there's, if there are men listening, it's totally fine. I would say this publicly, but I didn't say this, like we are such superior, amazing beings just by the sheer fact that we bring life into this world. Like, to do that, it, it's just, it blows your mind. It blows your mind. And so, you know, we, it's so important then as a result of that to have the space and place to share that powerful birth experience. I feel like, you know, it's such a whirlwind, right? Like however you enter labor, if it's your water breaks first or if it doesn't, but your contractions come first. And then it's like, whew, from that moment on, it's like, do I stay at home? Do I count my contractions? Do I go straight to the hospital? You know, there's buzzing and lights and, and everything if we go to the hospital. Uh, and then, you know, you're birthing for however long and then the baby comes and then you go home and then you don't sleep. There's oftentimes a little time to process your birth. And, and gosh, is that so necessary just to be able to go through it, whether it was the birth that you dreamed of or the birth that you never wanted to be able to process it because it is such a powerful experience. Yeah. So do you, we get a lot of questions and we're not really equipped to answer this, but I'm imagine that you do too. Um, a lot of women are curious as to where they should give birth. Uh, and as many of our viewers are aware, there's all kinds of different ways and facilities in which to do so. There are home births, there are birthing centers, there are hospitals. Uh, I'm just curious, how do you help a mom identify what birthing space is best for her? Yeah, it's a great question. And I always say it's wherever you feel the most safe is the best place for you to give birth. And for some that's at the hospital, for some that's at home, for some it's a birthing center near the hospital, but not in the hospital. Um, and so that's the, the number one thing I think to, to really recognize is where you're gonna feel the most safe and where you're gonna feel the most supported. Um, and like I said, that's, that's different for everyone. I think, you know, home birth is, has a, a, a stigma around it, or I think it's wildly misunderstood. I think that um, because so few, it's, I think it's like one or 2% of Americans give birth at home, right? It's just not, it's not what we're used to. It's not what we know. And the unknown, I mean, birth is already the great unknown, which is scary. Um, but I think there's a lot of judgment on things that are different. We know that. Um, and so I, I do think another, in, in a time that has been very difficult on birthing people and, and the birth world, um, I think 
has also been a, a silver lining of people starting to say, oh, what is home birth? Mm. I kind of get this. Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't have judged it so hard. And actually this, and once they, you know, we had articles coming out about the rise in home birth and people really learning that home birth wasn't just somebody going, you know, in their backyard and squatting behind a tree, right? It's not a dangerous, reckless thing to do. It's actually for some, um, for, for just like it is in the hospital for others, it's a place where they feel safe and supported, where they're getting undivided um, care and attention and also getting to um, be, have more authority over um, their, their decisions in the birth space. And so it's just different for everyone, but I do think that it's been exciting to see um, the, the conversation around home birth mm. open up. Um, in a positive way. And so I think I, my, my hope is that more people have access, whether it's financially or just provider wise or location to out of hospital birth um, for those who do feel safe outside of the hospital setting. But I think it's, it's so, it's such an individual choice. I wonder what you're seeing uh, just now in the pandemic, if you're seeing any, you know, data points or personal experience that, that, suggests that we are seeing an uptick in home births just because people are feeling less inclined to go into a hospital setting to deliver? Like what kinds of trends are you noticing right now? So early in the pandemic, especially when partners weren't allowed, it went way up. I think that was, they were like, okay, that's it. If my partner is not going to be able to be in this, on this journey with me, if my doula is not going to be able to be there. Um, and then I think the fear of COVID in the hospital, which is, which I think is less so now, um, really my midwife friends were like they've never gotten so many calls in their entire careers um as they had in that like one month period i think I, you know i think a lot of people maybe just thought about it and learned about it and then st stuck with hospital and then some people went through with it i certainly had clients who changed their course and, and went to home birth yeah so I, I think we do have like real research that it spiked. I don't know if it stayed up or if it was just that initial early period, but it did go up. Right. Yeah. We, um, you know, in New York, the, you can't have your partner, you know, during birth was about a six day stint, but my goodness, was it, you know, the women that had to endure that, that weren't able to switch to a home birth who still delivered in the hospital. Um, you know, we, we, we know a handful of women that had to experience that. And, and I, I, I just can't imagine, right? Like it's just speaking of the strength and courage of just birth in itself, but to do it alone, um, gosh, I hope we never have to. I think that was something that we, when we look back on this period, there will be deep uh, humiliation yeah. our, on this, on that. I think it was a, a barbaric move yeah. I think but, um it's one of those things that I hope policymakers are like I cannot believe we did that in 2020 um but I'm, I'm hoping that's in the past for good but you know we, we have that's part of evolution right is taking some steps steps back yeah so I have a final question for you um, and then uh, want to encourage folks that are with us, think about any questions that you might have for Carson um, after we get through this next question. Would love to give you all the opportunity to come on and ask yourself or put it in the chat. So be thinking, uh, what would you like to see more or less of in a woman's birth experience? Yeah, I think, um, I'm, I mean, I'd love to see more of um, a, a mother-led model in the birth environment, um, confidence, like I said, and, and information, education, and support, which is what you guys do. Um, and then I guess less of is less of the I can't, so you can't, and, and less fear, I think you know, a little, a little bit of fear is to be expected. Every new rite of passage comes with fear of the unknown. Um, but I guess the fear I'm referring to is external fear placed on, on you, um, or, or the culture of fear around it. And so that's something I hope. And I also wanted to add, this is kind of going back to the other question, but, um, in choosing your place of birth, 
and this, I guess they tie into both, but really finding out what your hospital policy is beforehand Mm -hmm. will help you decide where to birth, even if it's deciding on different hospitals. Um, But yeah, I hope we, I hope, and we have also can have more of a hospital birth culture that embraces some of the home birth ideas, Mm -hmm. because I know so many of us feel very safe at the hospital. And like I said, being where you feel safe is best, but I hope that we can, the hospitals um, or just the medical kind of obstetric community can embrace more as they have already. Um, And like you said, there's so many uh, OBs, nurses um, that I work with who inspire me and teach me and have been on the forefront of bringing a lot of this work into the hospital. But I think there's so much more that can be done to bring that the home to the hospital. Absolutely. I love that. The home to the hospital. And you touched on the I can'ts. Do you think that those are I can'ts that come from within? Or do you think that those are I can'ts that are precipitated from outside? If that makes sense as a question. I think they come, I think they start outside. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, I I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with the I can'ts from the inside. Mm -hmm as long as they have space to be held on the outside and and then the I cans are coming in. I think doubt is a normal part of the process. You could probably speak better to it as someone that's given birth, but I don't think doubt is necessarily bad. It's just a spectrum of, of the thoughts and emotions and feelings that come up. I think as long as we're not being infiltrated with it externally, then we can move through our own doubts internally. Right, I love that. So I just want to um, appeal to our great audience that is here with us today um, and use the last few minutes that we have with Carson and open it up for questions. Um, you know, if there's anybody here today that is expecting uh, and uh, you would like to ask her a question about anything that's come up today, or perhaps you know somebody that's expecting and you want to be supportive to them and mm-hmm. Um, you know, be there for them to the best of your ability. Any questions that are out there that anyone would like to ask? Now is the time. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Samantha. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm actually from Canada um, and I'm in a doula program in training. And I was just wondering what you had um, for any anything to say to a a doula in training? Yay, well, congratulations. So exciting. So excited for you to be doing this work. Um, Gosh, so much to say. I think just really prioritizing your self-care, as silly as that word is to me, but um, taking care of yourself um, I'm, I feel, and, and finding a mentor, I've, I felt, I was so fortunate. I've had a mentor who'd been doing it for 20 years and she really drilled that into me. She saw my enthusiasm and my love for this work and I would just give it my all. And then I would come home, but like just a hollowed out version of myself. And so like sustaining, um, yourself and not having that burnout, which, I find that burnout is why we are the way we are in in the the system that I've kind of been been criticizing through. I guess this right it is like some of the flaws in the system come from burnout, and I think we are just as susceptible to it as um, anybody else. And so, yeah, taking care of yourself. I am also big on just like continuous education and always learning. So, um, spinning babies, which I, I is a global organization, has offered so much valuable. Um, are you familiar with them at all yet? I don't know if you're on mute, but. Oh, sorry. What exactly? Spinning babies. Uh, what is that? It's um, it's an amazing organization um, that was started by Gail Tully, a, a midwife. And she went around the world to um, and, and worked with a lot of indigenous cultures and, and learned that, you know, here in um, our more modern birth experience, we have helped support the birth process, but we've also lost a lot of wisdom. And so her trainings are great. You can really learn how to use um, non-invasive tools and techniques and movements and positions to support fetal positioning um, and support your clients 
uh, inside and outside of the hospital. And that's all wisdom that she has um, learned through, through different cultures. So I, I recommend just always keep learning, which is something I'm still doing. Awesome, thank you so much. This has been so informative. Thank you. I'm so glad that you feel that way, Samantha. I have another question here in the chat. Um, Carson, could you talk a little bit about the difference between doulas and midwives or how a yeah. mom would choose between the two? Yes, great question. Um, so doulas, the, you can have a doula and a midwife. Doulas are non-medical. So I do not catch the baby. I don't take blood tests. I don't do blood pressure. I don't um, listen to baby's heart rate. I don't do vaginal exams. Um, when the baby is being born, I am always with my client in the presence of an OB or a midwife. Um, so really you'd be choosing between a midwife and an OB um, and then your doula follows you wherever you go. So we're, doulas are emotional, physical, support. We're advocates. We help with education. Your midwife is doing essentially everything an OB would be doing, in my opinion, even more prenatally. The visits are usually longer, right? With an OB, you tend to get like, I think it's seven to 15 minutes is the average. Um, with a midwife, they usually spend an hour with you. They really talk about um, nutrition, your emotional state, history maybe of, of your sexual history right and they, they get to know the whole 360 of you um and and help then help use that to support you in the birth process um midwives can be inside and outside of the hospital so even if you want to be um with a midwife and be in a hospital you can do that as well depending on your hospital um but most then there are not most but there are midwives who then just work outside of hospital and support home birth um if you had a high risk pregnancy or birth or need of a cesarean, that would be a situation where you would have to um, be with an OB. So it's really just up to you and what you have to offer. But um, we know that midwifery led low, low risk births that and, and the mid midwifery led model tends to um, bring better birth outcomes. And so OBs are, I mean, they're surgeons, they do incredible work and thank God we have their wisdom. Um, but not everybody needs to be um, with an OB if they don't want to. Another question here, um, Carson, how did your values change as a doula from beginning to now? Oh, that's a good question. My values. Um, I think, I don't know if I, my, my core values have changed, but I think when you just, the, the more I learn, the more I, I see what, um, I guess the, the more my perspective maybe has changed and I, I, I've touched upon this a little bit um, just earlier in the class that I think I, I definitely came into this work because of seeing the business of being born, of knowing um, what my role of an advocate would be and, and, and knowing, you know, just kind of some of the, the downsides of the birth world. But I, I don't think I realized until I was really um, ingrained in it and, and inside of the system and witnessing birth and submerging myself in the research and, and information around it, did I realize how much of that that would be? Yeah. Um, I have a question for you here, Carson. Um, so I'm actually in the same class as Samantha. There's actually a couple of us in the same program that are uh, hanging out with you today. So <laughs> we're all doulas in training. <laughs> you guys will have each other too, which is so important to have uh, like a sisterhood of new doulas to band together and support each other in this work. Yes, exactly. It's been great getting to know everybody for sure. Um, what I have a question for you is related to like your, your conversation about the business of birth and then also just your experience like in the hospital. What is your reaction when a healthcare provider maybe tries to step over you or the clients and try and make things their way instead of for the client's best interest? Like how do you personally react to that and how do you um, advocate and empower for your client. Thank you, Courtney. That's a really good and really difficult question. Um, as a certified doula, I was really, really taught to not speak on behalf of my client. So that was a really big part of my training and my scope of practice was emphasizing to my client that I'm there to um, prepare them and to be there to like, you know, if something comes up, I say to them, um, 
hey, you know, the, the nurse is going to start the Pitocin. Do you have any questions about that first? Um, do you want to ask any questions before they do this, this or that, that might not have been communicated and just kind of help to facilitate that conversation and um, hold space for the conversation. I have to be completely honest. I There's been a lot of situations where I found that model to not be quite as uh, foolproof or useful, right? Some of those tools that I was taught in more traditional training. Um, but I, because there's times where your client is not in a space to be speaking on behalf of, of her, you know, her own needs, or um, you do kind of see that happen behind their back. Again, I, I think it's really important to work in the prep and to say to your clients, look, this is, this is how comfortable, how, this is how comfortable I feel speaking on behalf of you. And then at a certain point, it's not, um, it is, it is you, I'm here to support you and support your voice. And I think you can actually do a disservice to your client when you start to overstep right in that way too but it's a really fine line I think this is when the partners really become so valuable and I really turn to the partners and I'm like this is the time where it's on you to really advocate right and you know your your partner is in deep in labor and um it's time for you to use your voice to help support her but then there's also times like for example when they're like you need to get on your back right of saying that to a client and I, I know that she doesn't legally she can be wherever she wants um, and yeah, so there have been times where I'm like, actually, she does not have to get on her back if she does not want to, you know, if my client's saying no, then I will stand up and voice my, what I'm seeing as well. Um, it is difficult. And I have to say, Courtney, I, and when I say continuing, continuing your education, I did not feel prepared for that part. Um, I didn't feel that any of my training gave me enough tools and really it taught me to do the opposite. It taught me to stand back and to not get in the way and to not, um, ever, create conflict with provider. And I, I don't believe in conflict. I don't think that's helpful for you or your client. Um, but I do think that all of us doulas need better tools in those situations when real um, obstetric violence and informed consent is not being used in the space, how we can um, assert ourselves and without overstepping our clients and also creating unnecessary conflict. So I hope that that helps answer the question. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I find I have more to learn in that area as well. It's an ongoing process. Awesome. It's like an ongoing learning experience for sure. Yeah. And it's just, I think going to differ between different clients and then different doctors and um, different situations. And just, you know, I'm, I always remind myself and my clients, I'm not a medical professional. So I'm really, I'm not going to ever step on a, a medical professional's toes in terms of what they're recommending, but I want my clients to know their rights. So if they need to, they can. So two more quick questions, and then we're going to end for today. I appreciate y'all for hanging on just a little bit longer. The questions are so great that I don't want to miss anything. Um, I'm going to try to tackle this one. And then if there's anything that you have to add, Carson, please let me know. Do you have any resources or tips for clients who have suffered from past sexual trauma? This is such a really, really important question. Um, and I will tell you in the work that we do at the Motherhood Center, I would say at least 50% of the women we treat have had, have had some kind of sexual trauma or sexual abuse history. Uh, and one of the things, another one of the things that we don't tell women enough is if you do have a sexual trauma or sexual abuse history, that the birth experience, pregnancy and postpartum can be very triggering. Uh, and we're not, we don't anticipate that. Um, and it makes a lot of sense why. And there's a lot of, you know, clinical uh, expertise that supports it as much. Um, I do have some articles and resources that I would be happy to share. You know, just the simple response to that is that there are trauma-informed mechanisms and tools that we can use. You know, I would, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Carson, but it might be helpful as you're getting to know a woman that you are going to be working with, or if you are a survivor of sexual assault or trauma, that you let your doula and your midwife and or, or OBGYN know, um, because many are trained to be able to handle those situations. And just a very simple rule of thumb that for a woman who has a, a sexual trauma history is that we don't wanna tell her what to do. We want to give her permission to choose, right? And so some simple ways to phrase that might be, if you feel comfortable, you can try. 
I invite you to try, right? But we want to stay away from telling her that she has to do something and let it be her choice. And Carson, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Yeah, I think, well, I, I agree with everything you said. And I think especially the last part, I think every woman should be treated like she has the choice because yep. she does. Um, but even more important for reasons that you just pointed out. But I also, I have some clients that offer it, you know, their, their story to me and others that don't. Um, but I think knowing what we know about sexual trauma and how um, prevalent it is, it, it, I work from the understanding or for sorry, the, the assumption that everybody I'm working with has some sexual trauma in their past. Mm -hmm. um, they don't, great. But I think more off, more times than not, statistically, it, there's going to be some instance. And um, so I, I try to implement that just proactively and um, really, right, like even just when I'm doing comfort measures, right, like, can I, is it okay if I touch you? Is it okay if I do this? And and if you don't be afraid to ask, if, if you have a doula that might not work from that, those, you know, techniques, just asking your provider or anybody you're working around um, and reminding them how important it is for, for that permission to be granted before um, any physical touch, or as you said, um, kind of authority is, um, is placed on, on the client as I, and then um, vaginal exams are, are very, um, doctors love to do vaginal exams um, because it, it gives them a, a snapshot of where you're at in labor. Um, you do not have to have a vaginal exam if you don't want it. Um, and so having a conversation with your provider beforehand about minimizing vaginal exams or um, only having them when necessary or desired on the, the patient's side, I think is a way of also minimizing um, unnecessary uh, touch down there. Great. And then final question, what are your doula bag necessities, Carson? Yeah, so I bring um, a hot water bottle that you can fill up. It's really nice for the belly and the back. Um, honey sticks for a little energy for my clients. When they're pushing, I bring essential oils like peppermint, lavender, um, and lemon. Uh, the peppermint's great for nausea. Lavender is nice for relaxation. I bring a diffuser. Um, I bring Christmas lights and little battery operated candles to create a nice um, environment in the room. I bring a birth ball with a handy cover so it's easy to carry um, and a rebozo. And then I bring um, water for myself, snacks for myself, um, things that, you know, my toothbrush, things that are going to make me feel good where if I'm, you know, somewhere for 40 hours. Um, yeah, that's about it. Mm. Carson, I cannot thank you enough for joining us today. This was so such an important conversation. I can tell that so many people that joined us really got a lot out of this. Uh, I just want everyone to know that uh, this will be recorded. We'll be putting it up on our website, hopefully by the end of the week, if not next week, so that you can go back and watch it. We'll also be sending up a thank you email for everybody who registered and including the link in that. Uh, and, you know, if you should have any questions about PMADS or, or anything else, just know that the Motherhood Center is here for you. Um, and Carson, you and I are going to talk after this because we have some really exciting ideas on how we can bring, you know, more education around emotional wellness to the doula community. Um, so I look forward to continuing to work with you on these exciting opportunities um and just want to thank everyone again for joining us today thank you guys it's been such a pleasure thank you Paige, and um excited for all you new doulas out there all right thanks everybody thanks carson bye